Dias Mariv, Gunushal, good morning everyone and welcome to uh, this next session of, of, of Getty. Um, thank you very much, Jochen, for your, your words of welcome. Uh, in, in conversation with Jochen beforehand, I, I discovered he had had an entire week of uninterrupted good weather in Ireland. More, more people have witnessed the risen Christ than have seen that, frankly. It, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's something else again. Um, we now turn to, to, if you like, the, the official business. The, this is a, almost our first normal day in Getty, insofar as normal can be applied uh, to this gathering. And it, it's uh, my enormous pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Dr. Ivana Noble, who comes to us from, from Prague. Um, Ivana is someone who had the enormous good sense to be born in 1966. Later on, there will be articles on the ecumenical significance of this post-Vatican II development. Um, Ivana's published work uh, brings together a number of themes that, that, that work together nicely. There is an injection of hope uh, and, a, and, a, and an enthusiasm for the appropriate methodological rigor for dealing with the, the postmodern context of contemporary Europe. She's professor of ecumenical theology in, 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 in Prague, as I say, and has served as the uh, president of, of Societas Ecumenica. And at that stage, when we were editing papers from one of our, our programs, we got a hint of the kind of theological issues that float Ivana's boat when she, she insisted that we would have a bit of creativity on the cover rather than some kind of mandatory binding that made it look terribly academic. And you can see this if you look for the proceedings of our conferences in, in Prague and in Belgrade where there was a, an element of considerable creativity visit. So you can expect creativity as Ivana talks to us about her introduction to the ecumenical movement. Ivana. <coughs> Very much. The first challenge would be to make the technology work. <laughs> but uh, this is where I rely on creativity of other people. Thank you very much. So my biggest worry is over. And uh, again, I want to thank you for inviting me to give this opening lecture. I think it's my pleasure for several reasons. Uh, when I will speak about a humanical situation in Europe, I don't expect that you can cut Europe like with a pair of scissors from the map of the world and have one whole. So my first joy is that this is a really global meeting and there are several of you which are from other continents and with other perspectives. Uh, I think another reason for my joy is to see the next generation of people who will come and do theology and ecumenical theology creatively and who will have answers to questions uh, which we have never even asked ourselves, people in my 1966 generation. And I think it's always joy to see. A friend of mine used to say that up till you are about 40, you need to learn to listen to people who are older than you. And afterwards, you need to listen and learn from people who are younger than you. So I look forward very much to our discussion. I will look first at a couple of things which may provide context to our talking about uh, ecumenism 
uh, ecumenics and ecumenical theology today in Europe. And first I would look at what I may call external factors. Not external in the way that they would not touch us, but external in the sense that they are not directly theological, uh, they are applicable to the setting in which all of us live, whether we are theologians, Christians, or anybody else. And I just want to look very briefly at some of the uh, elements which I think contribute to what we may call today a crisis of European society and European culture. Don't worry, the lecture will not be all grim. Uh, but I think we need to uh, struggle also with some of the more difficult issues. Uh, it was uh, Jean-François Lyotard who in postmodern condition at the end of 1970s said that uh, we live in uh, the West in the societies where the uh, knowledge, the education is much more connected to money, to finances and to power than it has been the case before. And I think that this is something which we can see also when we follow the impact of the financial crisis, which uh, in 2008 uh, reached the worst point compared to the 1930s, namely the time before the uh, Second World War. And I think that this is one impact which we really need to take seriously because the financial crisis influenced, for example, how many theological institutions stayed in Europe. It influenced the scholarship, how the social work we just have heard about could or could not be financed. So this is something which we need to take on board as one of the external factors. Then uh, I think it was uh, connected to some other crises. I will mention only some of them. 2014, we have roughly the peak of the Ukrainian crisis, uh, the annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation, the war in Donbass, and the rise of Putin's power. Uh, in uh, Czech Republic from that time, uh, at least this was one period when we were hospitable, I couldn't say it about some other things later. We had Ukrainian students, Ukrainian people in our hospitals, uh, and uh, uh, there was an attempt to uh, support uh, the uh, site which was in minority and in disadvantage. But then none of these crises seems to take uh, the long time uh, in the public attention because there were, thank you, there were other crises coming to follow. In 2014, uh, Islamic State declared the establishment of a caliphate claiming responsibility for a number of recent terrorist attacks in Europe. Uh, again, Europe is not the only place uh, where terrorist attacks happen, and not even the place where most of them happen. But I think when I speak about Europe, this is something which has again been brought to our attention. Uh, year later, the peak of the financial crisis in Greece, where it looked that the first state in the European Union uh, would have to, if not to leave the Union, to leave uh, uh, some of the uh, structures of EU, like the Eurozone, possibly, uh, and that it would be the first big break uh, in the European unity, so, uh, which lasted such a long time to reach. Uh, and then uh, we haven't recovered from the Greek financial crisis and then there were the numbers growing and growing of refugees, especially from Syria, Afghanistan and Iraq, but also from other countries. And together with that we had the new rise of nationalism, especially in the post-communist countries. Like I told you, we were hospitable to the Ukrainians we definitely were not hospitable to Syrians and others who came in need. And our society became really very divided, almost in two halves on that. Uh, we were very uh, upset with the attitude of our president and some parts in our governments when the Czech Republic said, no, we would not take the European quota on refugees. We can't help them. Uh, and uh, this was such a blow to us. Uh, because so many Czech people in, uh, during the war period uh, after communism came after 1968 
found shelter in the West, they were helped, and now we refused help to some other people. And this was incredibly difficult to live with, and it has made a big negative impact on the society, but also on the churches in the society, which were actually also divided on the matter. Uh, I mentioned already the rise of nationalism in the post-communist countries, but they are not only ones in this camp. Uh, we were very glad to see the results of the elections in France, uh, and uh, I think uh, it gave us hope that it is not always now that the more nationalist and xenophobic side of the society have to win. And 2016, we have Brexit here, where most of the people in Britain thought it could never happen, and it did. So these are, I think, some of the negative uh, factors which we need to take on board when we think about uh, uh, ecumenism and ecumenical theology today, because these are the things against which we will have to seek for our hope and which will have to inform our actions. But we can maybe look also at another map of what has changed in the last decade, and I may call this internal factors, something which perhaps influenced Christian community more from within. In 2013, uh, something quite unexpected happened. Uh, I put here Habemus Papam, uh, we have a Pope, uh, the Pope Francis election, just about in the time when many of us thought that the Vatican Curia can't change and that the Roman Catholic Church in its top hierarchy would always represent one of the most conservative forces, things actually have changed. And they haven't changed through uh, in, uh, reform of the structures but they changed through a very different public face of the church. Very different public face and very different dream of the church. And I will come back later to that. Uh, there were new possibilities and new relations which uh, demonstrably opened very shortly after that, both with the Eastern churches, but also with the Protestant and Evangelical churches. I remember shortly after the election of Pope Francis, I went to teach in Slovakia in one of the evangelical groups. And I was quite touched when the pastor told me that for the first time he felt that he can pray for the Pope as for somebody who would be part of his church communion. And this would be something completely unimaginable, uh, even a couple of years before that. Uh, then, uh, I think this, uh, this is just one example, not the only one, but it has led also to some joint activities. In 2015, there was the joint effort in response to the ecological crisis and poverty. Uh, here, again, the ecumenical patriarch and the pope as well as the World Council of Churches, or CAC, would meet at the very common activities. If I were to be critical, I would have to say that the, both the Vatican and the ecumenical organizations, they gave very weak response to the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, on the other hand, there was a very strong response to the refugee crisis. I will try to look at later why this was the case. Uh, at the moment, we can just notice that. And by the ecumenical organizations I want to speak about, I mean the World Council of Churches, Conference of European Churches, but also the Churches Commission for Migrants in Europe. Uh, I think regarding the, uh, what we call refugee crisis, but it is really also our crisis of the response uh, to uh, refugees and migrants in need, coming to our wealthy Europe. And then 2016, uh, we need to name another unexpected event prepared for a long time, and this is the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church. Many critics said that it was neither holy nor great and nor pan-Orthodox, uh, but I think uh, 
if uh, we are not going to be maximalists, we have to recognize that this has been an achievement and it has been at least the first step towards uh, conciliarity in the greater communion of the Orthodox Church or churches. Now, ecumenism when Christianity is not at the center of the stage. Now, this is uh, how I call the next section of what I want to speak about. Uh, when the uh, ecumenical <coughs> movement uh, in the 20th century rose uh, as a response to the divided world, Christianity would be still seen as the majority religion in Europe. Now we are in a slightly different situation. Uh, and I want to look at two challenges which are present to us now. Uh, the first challenge I called new phase of secularization and the second one a new phase of religious pluralism. I think about 10 years back, 20 years back, when I taught on secularization and secularism, I used to say that in the post-communist Europe, we are behind the peak of secularization. That secularization, which was part of the communist ideology, as secularism, discredited itself because it was enforced. And although after the fall of communism, we didn't become again a Christian country, it was actually really difficult to find atheists in the country. Atheists would be the smallest minority, not according to census, but according to the other uh, investigations like European value studies. Uh, the greatest percentage of population would be people who would not identify themselves with any religious institution or community, but who would believe in something. And these beliefs in something, they would go two main directions. One of them, it would be more the ethical, moral belief. People who would not believe in life after death, maybe. Who would not believe in personal God, as we know it in Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. But who would uh, say that uh, justice matters, and it has an ultimate value who would believe in difference between grace and sin, and who would, uh, I think, put together fragments of what we may call a kind of moral religion without religious roots. The other direction would go more the spiritual direction. It would be the people who would say that they don't believe in God, but they pray or meditate. You have many absurdities in those faiths the people who would meditate and pray and believe either in reincarnation or the life after death. It would be very syncretistic, and yet it would be far from secular atheism or even agnosticism. And I think it was important to recognize that uh, at the turn of the century or perhaps the first decade of the new millennium, because as Christians we have different partners of the dialogue. It felt that when the church is said, now we need to embrace secular society, the secular society was no longer there, so the arms often remained empty. But the situation has changed back, uh, or maybe forward and back at the same time. Uh, I think in the Western countries where the secularization was not connected to communist ideology and where the churches still had stronger life uh, than in, uh, let's say, Czechoslovakia or formerly eastern part of Germany, just close to here, uh, the secularization still keeps coming. And it's a different kind of secularization than what we had in the last century. Yeah, quite often this would be economically based secularization, uh, which uh, I think would uh, change what is financed in the society. And it would affect churches, it would affect theological education, uh, it would affect different uh, Christian or other religious organizations. And it would not happen on the 
ideas based or ideological based this discrimination, but purely at the economical basis. Then I still remember when uh, Dawkins' book came first, the Czech Republic, and people laughed at that. Uh, it didn't do really well because we thought this is something which we had here in the past. It's nothing new to us. And now it's interesting, through the very youngest generation, through the students who go on Erasmus to study in Western Europe and who are young enough not to remember the communism, which is good, uh, but they get excited about the secularist idea and the new atheism, and then they bring it back to our country again. So uh, this exchange has very many positive uh, aspects, but it also has some of the more complicated aspects. So I think we are dealing again with the youngest generation, uh, with the new atheism, and with that new secularism. Being part of different boards and commissions and uh, grant agencies, which is the more boring part of my life, but unfortunately unavoidable, I also meet these colleagues when we evaluate projects, something we are not allowed to pass on with names, but I can speak about it generally. And it's interesting that among the youngest generation, you would sometimes find people who would be on mission, and their mission would be to eliminate anything to do with religion from fundable projects or from uh, something which would be part of the broader society than only the churches. And this is new for us. We haven't had that 10 years ago and not even five years ago. So this is what I called perhaps economically based new wave of secularization. It affects also the role of the churches in the public life. Coming from uh, the country where former religion has really very little percentage representation in the society, we still were used to some quite bizarre features. Like before elections, most of the politicians, including the least trustworthy ones, would want to claim some connections with church or some other religious group because they thought it would help them in election. And it's quite uh, unexpected in the society which would claim to be secular. It doesn't fit. Or in the small part uh, of Prague where I go to church regularly, it is in the outskirts of Prague, uh, people who would come to our church maybe only around Christmas, they would speak about the church as their church. We would belong to their life. And they were always very happy about that. They would come when there would be some problems. Uh, the church was the center of the civic forum during the Velvet Revolution. It was the center of the help of the people during the floods. Uh, it hoped to be center of some refugee help if the refugees were allowed to our country. Uh, but uh, it would belong to the lives of the people in a different way. Now uh, the situation will change again because there is a different uh, uh, way how the state-church relations are going to be organized. There would be more stronger split. But with the more stronger split, there are some new initiatives who want to push away the church from the public life. And in this, we now follow the Western Europe for things like that were happening for longer period of time. If I read newspaper in Holland or if I read newspaper in Britain, uh, it would be the case in the last couple of decades that if you read about uh, one of the major newspapers about church, it would be either some sex abuse case or some other scandal which the Christianity uh, or Christians were involved with. If you read a newspaper in my country about church or some church activity, it would often be culture related, it would be related to some social work, or it would be uh, educational, especially bit, uh, before big feasts. Now I think it's mixing a little bit more. Uh, so uh, I think when we speak about ecumenism and ecumenical activities, this would be the stage in which our ecumenical activities will take place. 
we will no longer be the main players in most of European countries. And the situation of a minority may give us some disadvantages, but also it may give us some more new possibilities. And the new possibilities, not going to the past, uh, but looking forward, uh, is something which you will develop. And you will see things which my generation and the generations before me haven't seen yet. Uh, a new phase of religious pluralism. Christianity in our part of the world, especially in the last uh, four or five years, has been also used as a tool to defend xenophobic politics. And it's interesting that a number of churches and church representatives actually stood up against that. Not all of them, but there were some public speeches. Uh, for example, Christianity was used to argue that we are not going to accept any migrants and refugees because we have our wonderful Christian culture which we don't want to be spoiled. People who said that they didn't have a clue about what Christianity is and loving your neighbor as yourself and loving your God would not come anywhere near uh, their frame of reference. And yet they would use this rhetoric. Uh, Christianity, uh, that would be a useful tool for them to gain access to the political life, would be now on the side of those who stand against others to defend their advantages. Uh, I had uh, once a very strange experience when I went to the police station. Uh, I came back from a sabbatical in France and the first thing I saw near our home was on the road signs a sticker in Arabic and in English, refugees are not welcome. In Arabic, when a friend of mine translated it to me, there were some mistakes. So it said, refugees are not welcome to themselves. So <laughs> at least there was some joy in the error. But I was so offended by that, that I thought I will go to the police and I will say that someone transgressed the law there and I want that to be removed and to find out who did that. Uh, I came to the police and they looked at me as if I came straight from the moon. And I realized that uh, although it's not allowed to put stickers on the transport signs, uh, they actually all agreed with what was written on them. And I had to force them to investigate the case. And also the policemen, they used the Christian vocabulary when they talked to me. Uh, that do I want uh, that nice Christian world to be destroyed? Uh, do I want to wear burqa in a couple of years' time? These prejudices which are spread through the society because of the lack of knowledge of the real people. People don't see the faces of the others. They have prejudices about them. And sometimes this is given mark Christianity. So I think that there is quite a lot of ecumenical work to be done uh, around here. And there is actually quite a lot of ecumenical activities which are done. Another feature which I think we need to look at is uh, that uh, Islam seemed to uh, play much bigger role in the societies, but again, not necessarily positively. Uh, but I think it's worth mentioning that investigating uh, the study of Islam is politically more important than Christianity. And again, in different commissions where I sit, you can see it with the projects which will get finances. Why? Because Islam is seen as a threat. Therefore, we need to study it. Therefore, we need to invest into this. And again, the financial ideology would be so much part of the reasons which we find in the society. And the next thing is the financial undercutting of theological institutions and shift towards religious studies. In former communist Europe, we are still in a little bit luckier position because the communist authorities, they, uh, in many of our countries, they put theological faculties and seminaries out of universities, usually around 1950. 
So any government who would now abolish theological institution would act like the communists. And this is not something which would uh, uh, be good for your next election campaign. So our theological faculties still hopefully will last a little bit longer till we have enlightened people coming from the West, bringing with us these wonderful ideas that we can abolish theology because nobody really needs it. But I think the shift towards religious studies really happens on the regular basis. Many of you who come from Western Europe uh, you, uh, or from uh, Ameri uh, uh, United States, uh, you probably experienced how theological institutions were gradually dying uh, and they were transformed into institutions of religious studies. Don't get me wrong, I have nothing against religious studies as a discipline. But again, this is a financially motivated decision. And this would shape in the next generation the profile of ecumenical theology. Because there would be fewer and fewer people who would actually be able to have degree in theology. And the structural knowledge of Christian traditions, Christian sources, which theological education offers, uh, will I think really suffer with that. And when we speak about the future, the presence and the future of ecumenism, this is something which we need to keep in mind. New possibilities, developing old experiences and visions. I would like now to look at four expressions of ecumenism as they develop in the history of modern ecumenical movement and maybe ask what would be their expression in our new contexts. I want first to look at ecumenism as ecclesiological conviction or ecclesiological vision, then at ecumenism as politics, then at ecumenism as mission and education, and finally, at ecumenism as spirituality. Ecumenism as ecclesiological conviction, antinomy or synergy. Is ecumen in other words, is ecumenism and ecclesiology something which will always have to clash together? Or is it something which can uh, work together in penetrate each other even if one cannot be reduced to each other. I put here a quotation by Karl Barth from 1936. The union of the churches is not made, but we discover it. I, do, I put it here not because I would agree with it, but because I think it represents one of the uh, specific attitudes towards ecumenism. Uh, when I first came to the uh, Orthodox Center of uh, Saint Serge in Paris a uh, number of years back, uh, it was uh, interesting for me to realize that many people who were from the very first moment very hospitable to me and to my colleague who visited that place would have a very negative understanding of ecumenism. And it would be the case because they encountered people working in ecumenical circles who uh, used the place and who used the people. And it brought me back to one of my experiences long time ago at Keck meeting in Prague, which was actually a very conflictual meeting. I think it was 1991. And uh, at the end of that meeting, the Orthodox delegation walked out of the door and I didn't blame them, basically. What happened there was that uh, issues which were not discussed in any of the meetings and which were related to church's relationship to homosexuality, and don't get me wrong, I don't represent here the conservative camp. Uh, the issues which were not discussed, uh, some group wanted to push them to the final document. And then it created quite a lot of unsettling. And the people who left said, there is nothing about spirituality, there is nothing about religious traditions. It's just lobbying and politics. And unfortunately, people have experience like that with ecumenism as well. 
and some people are harmed by this type of experience with ecumenism. And therefore, ecumenism is seen as something which you don't do. You discover it. Unity of the church is something which you don't do. It's genuine only if it grows on its own. Only if it is only the gift of God. As soon as people start uh, working with it as well, it gets mucky. Yes, it gets mucky when we start working with it. Uh, but I think we need to be the cooperators with God. If I am not wrong, uh, I think already St. Paul reminds us of that. There are some pictures from important events in the last century, ecumenism. Founding assembly in Amsterdam in 1948 uh, and Pope John XXIII announcing the Second Vatican Council in 1959. You know, the old harmless Pope which was elected because uh, no disturbance was expected from him and here he is full of life. But uh, I think when we speak about ecumenism today in Europe, we cannot simply go only to its glorious past or ambivalent past together with the glorious past. I think we need to ask where is it today, what are the positive processes accompanying the decrees of European churches and their influence. And again, I hope that this would be one of the questions which you would be dealing with yourself. Ecumenism as politics. Well, I have chosen before one example which can uh, represent the negative use of ecumenism as politics when I spoke about my experience at the Keck Assembly in Prague. But uh, I think that uh, what we experience now is also that uh, ecumenism moves from using the political to support ecclesiastical interests to using the experience of ecumenical ecclesiality for challenging the political and economical ideologies. And I think in this sense, uh, we can see some kind of rehabilitation of ecumenical engagement in the political. When Pope Francis decides to take a couple of refugee families to live with him in the Vatican, it's a political gesture. It's a political gesture to show the other uh, bodies in the society and in the churches, that it can be done. When Teze community is present in Calais, it's a political gesture. It shows that there are other attitudes than refusal which are possible. But I think we need to ask what is the nature of this engagement? and how the ecclesial diplomatic and the prophetic coexist with each other. Uh, and I think the ecclesial diplomatic and the prophetic you can sometimes find coexisting in the same institutions. Before I spoke about the Ukrainian crisis and I said that the responses of the ecumenical organizations and the responses of the Pope or to this crisis were weaker than I thought than they could be. Uh, perhaps with understandable reasons, but still relatively weak. Uh, when uh, the first meeting between the Pope and the Moscow Patriarch happened, uh, this was uh, quite an important event. And yet the conditions for this event was that the case of Ukraine would not be discussed. Some other things could be discussed, but not that. Similarly, when the Pan-Orthodox Council was prepared, uh, the Ukrainian uh, church uh, sent a long letter asking for help and for intervention in their case. And if this would happen, uh, probably the Pan-Orthodox Council would be boycotted still more than it was uh, by the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. So here we have a case of ecclesial diplomacy. 
something which is perhaps more difficult to accept because it doesn't have an attractive face. Uh, there would be other examples of ecclesial diplomacy which we would still perhaps carry in our memory and we would not be proud of them. There would be the ecclesial diplomacy uh, related uh, to national socialism in Germany, both on the side of the Protestant churches and on the side of the Roman Catholic Church. There would be an ecclesial diplomacy which I have experienced myself as a student when I studied in Bosse, when people working in the ecumenical organizations knew that people from our part of the world who would be representing the churches would be basically secret policemen. They knew it and they felt that they couldn't challenge it because the fragile communication between East and West would be the price to be paid for it. Uh, I could use some other examples which would also touch on situation outside of Europe. And then uh, we have some uh, ecclesial diplomacy which would challenge that and which would open new possibilities and which would lead towards reconciliation. But I think the interaction with the prophetic would be really important. I always admired uh, the uh, Episcopal Conference in Chile in particular, or in Latin America, uh, which had the courage to say that uh, everybody who participates in killing and torturing people is by this very act excommunicated from the church. This was one instance of excommunication where I thought it actually makes sense it can have a positive usage. So this is where I would see the prophetic being used also in the ecclesial diplomatic relations. Uh, then, I think we uh, need to ask to what degree do power sensitivities limit involvement on behalf of the needy? Uh, I think in the examples where I, which I choose uh, you can see that this question would be really difficult. And maybe if we had a time for the discussion in groups, you would see that you may have actually different opinion on that. And that the big pictures, they always look differently if you know the situation from the ground and the complexities from the ground. But these two expressions of rehabilitation of the ecumenical engagement in the political, the ecclesial diplomatic and the prophetic, they need to coexist, even if they would be, I think, always in some conflicting relationship. Uh, I have decided to choose some nice quotations from people who... Uh, at the beginning uh, or in the middle of the last century, uh, perhaps engaged in similar dilemmas as we do today, and who try to express their brave ideas against that background. One of them is uh, a religious philosopher Nikolai Berdyaev, one of the uh, Russian refugees who was forced to leave Russia after Bolshevik Revolution in 1922, and who took it as his mission that the freedom who can, which cannot be lived in his country now will be lived among the refugees, whether he lived in Berlin or later in Paris. And oh, he was orthodox, but also he was very ecumenically minded. But the type of ecumenism he pleaded for would not be what he called the ecumenism an ecumenical minimum, that we agree that we all believe in one God and some of us believe in the Holy Trinity, uh, but that it has to be what he called the ecumenical maximalism that would take us to the common conversion to the source of life. He says, people of a conservatively orthodox mindset, esteeming themselves as bearers of orthodox truths, have defended the right to serve them to a despotic state, army and military, the death sentence and flogging nationalism, total enmity towards other peoples and anti-Semitism, 
They have defended the injustice of man. He doesn't use inclusive language, sorry about that. Have denied freedom of conscience and thought. Have expelled from the church all human creativity. Have been cruel and pitiless towards man on the basis that he is a sinner. So, I think we can read something like that against the context. I was speaking about earlier on. But then Berdyaev speaks about freedom and responsibility and creativity. And perhaps with him I can also say that this freedom, responsibility and creativity is also yours. That you are the people who would be seeking for the new responses to the challenges we face together and it's good that you could do it together. Ecumenism as politics. Uh, I have here uh, another extract from Pope Francis, which I think is very similar to another speech uh, which happened much, much earlier on by Martin Luther King in his famous speech for the March for Justice and Equality. I have a dream. Uh, and in his dream, the black and the white would walk together. So Pope Francis also has a dream. I dream of a Europe that is young, still capable of being a mother. A mother who has life because she respects life and offers hope for life. I dream of a Europe that cares for children, that offers fraternal help to the poor and those newcomers seeking acceptance because they have lost everything where being a migrant is not a crime, but a summons the greater commitment on behalf of the dignity of every human being. Ecumenism as mission and education. In both secularizing Europe and Europe facing the return of religion, which is not the cultured, ecumenically open Christianity. Uh, the concept of return of religion is used in several different meanings in philosophy of religion and in theology nowadays. Uh, but uh, I think I wouldn't want to go uh, into detail into that very concept. What I would want to look at is uh, precisely the challenges for mission and education with, with religion which is returning quite often to people as a threat. As a threat, as something which they cannot understand and they cannot control it. This is why they close theological institutions to help them understand it. Anyway, uh, but uh, this is the unknown face. It usually has the name Islam because this is the most feared religion and most unknown of the monotheistic religion in many parts of Europe. Uh, but it's also claimed the irrationality of religion because Islamic people are not the only ones who are associated with violent actions. But I speak here at, about the return of religion in the scary ways in the ways when religion is recognized as important, but it is unwanted as such. So, uh, how does Christian mission step into this territory? I think we need to recognize that there is a growing disagreement on what a Christian mission means. Is it primarily about gaining converts, and if so, to what? This question was always, uh, I think, on the four. And uh, when you look at the history of Edinburgh, 1910, uh, the missionary conferences which were preparing this big event, they were actually discussing if they should invite the Catholics and the Orthodox. And the argument for not inviting them was that they are not properly Christian people, uh, that they are the people who should be evangelized. And it was actually people from the evangelical and protestant circles who said no to that. Uh, that they should be invited and they should be seen as the properly Christian people. Debate which happened long time ago. 
Uh, but if you look at the so-called missionaries who often work among students and among young people, uh, this would be uh, this type, which uh, I think was present in the early mission conferences, which would emphasize so strongly converting to one particular, often ideological version of Christianity. Uh, I do not know how in your countries, but in my country, when I meet with students who do not come from religious background and they encounter some other Christians, this is what would be quite often their experience. Or is it witnessing that the kingdom of God has touched this world? Witnessing in a way of living, in action, in sharing inner sources, but also outer resources. I think some of which we could hear about uh, when we hear about this building, and I'm sure you will encounter much more during your two weeks here. What is mission? And I think that this is something which will have to be addressed and discussed again and again in each generation, because it's an integral part of us being Christian, sharing our faith. But how are we to share it together? And where would be the limits of this togetherness? Discerning possibilities, decreasing possibilities of state-founded sound theological education I have spoken already about. And the shifts towards either religious studies, confessional church seminaries, or ecumenical initiatives operating as NGOs. However problematic this can be, this also can bring some new freedom and new possibilities. But I think that the ecumenical organizations would need to be aware of that and in time prepare alternatives which would break, bridge the gap which will appear, I think, still in your generation. Ecumenism as a mission and education, I already spoke about Edinburgh uh, 2010. Uh, and uh, uh, I would want maybe to do some comparison now. There were eight commissions established at Edinburgh in uh, 1910 uh, to look at uh, particular uh, aspects of life, carrying the gospel to all the non-Christian world, the church in the mission field, education in relation to the Christianization of national life, missionary message, in relation to the non-Christian world, the preparation of missionaries, the home base of missions, missions and governments. Some of these aspects would, I think, uh, be facing us the opposite direction now, like education in relation to the Christianization of national life. I think we may now speak more about education in relation uh, the Christian critique of nationalism. The context changes, the task change with the context, but some of the invitations, they prevail. What would be the current alternatives, responses to what need a challenge and hope now? Students, NGOs, ecclesial and ecumenical initiatives have been involved in helping the refugees, challenging nationalism, challenging what is called the post-truth politics. Uh, you could see it very clearly, for example, with Donald Trump elections, but also in our smaller countries, in our presidential elections as well. The candidate for a president is found lying in the public campaign. It is unmasked, and he says, so what? Uh, it's a skillful politics, and this is acceptable. Uh, so uh, I think uh, this is something which uh, the ecumenical and Christian initiatives would need to take on board, and creating what may be called hate-free zones. I think we need also to ask ourselves, are we in a less mature stage of the response is the situation too quickly changing in front of our eyes? Again, the response would be yours. There are places where Christian spirituality is lived now, and it is lived there ecumenically. There is a number of them. But I think uh, while we can enjoy the hospitality of the monasteries, ecumenical retreats, 
ecumenical spiritual direction, ecumenical chaplaincies, the World Community for Christian Meditation, and so on and so on. Uh, we need to recognize that what has uh, made these things possible, the institutional life, like the monasteries and religious orders in Europe, they are on decrease. And some of them may disappear in a generation or two. So who would be the next carrier of these tasks? And maybe you can meditate on it when you think about what you are going to do with your life. It's impossible to go back, but it's possible to go forward with the knowledge of the past. Ecumenism as a spirituality, I have one more example here, but I want to go to the fa couple more. I want to go to the final quote. I carry inside myself my earlier faces, as a tree contains its rings. The sum of them is me. The mirror sees only my latest face, while I know all my previous ones. This is a memory, uh, uh, this is a poem by Thomas uh, Transtuner. I think something similar can be said about ecumenical movement. Uh, that we carry within ourselves all the previous rings. But life is never repeated. And the hope needs to be found in each generation anew, as well as the very particular possibilities of what to contribute to that hope. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Ivana, um, for a wonderful paper. Otherwise, I think the stick, oh. the, the, the stick one walked about. Um, have, have a seat whilst we, we sort you out. Um, Ivana has very kindly agreed to take questions, and we have some minutes before coffee becomes uh, urgent uh, for, <laughs> for, for our speaker and possibly for some in, in the audience as well. So we're placing a microphone here. Uh, so if you would like, if you have a burning question that you need to ask Ivana, can you make your way here so that we can, we can capture uh, the beauty of your voice and your physical appearance on film? Uh, and, and then Ivana will, 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 will address your question. So if you will come, come up to the microphone. Begin, begin a bit of a cue, if you don't mind, because then we'll have an idea how, at what point we need to eradicate members of the queue. Uh, in the interests of caffeine. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind saying who you are and, and where you come from, that would be lovely. Thank you. Technology, sorry. <laughs> so I will say it again. Uh, this would not be my position that Islam is the most feared religion, but it is the position in my society. And I think it, it is be, uh, most feared because it's the least known religion. And uh, people would quite often associate it with the negative uh, uh, aspects which we can find with extremism. You have extremism in any religion. Uh, it's, uh, so I think it's quite distorted uh, image of Islam. 
and I'm really quite unhappy with that image. But I think when we work with the society, this is the prejudice which we have to work against and with, and therefore we need to know the prejudice. Very much for the question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I think that my position probably would not be more typically Western, but it would be very typically post-communist. And I think having had the experience of it, uh, uh, Soviet Union being near to us, this would definitely bear uh, influence on not only on my position, but also on the position <coughs> of others. Uh, I think if we were to discuss it at the level of the political action, uh, there would be indeed different opinions. And it would be, I think, uh, being prophetic doesn't mean that everybody would be happy and things would be nice and smooth. Uh, I think it's impossible from the uh, politological point of view not to notice uh, the rise and the imperial visions of the current Russia. And indeed, people who would buy to this dream, they would have very different opinion from mine. But I think I would still hold, want to hold on to mine. Uh, I think uh, the new imperialism which we can witness uh, is something which perhaps also needs to be challenged from Christian point of view. Uh, it goes along with the new nationalism and I think within the sphere of uh, former influence of Russia, uh, this is really difficult. You need indeed to go also in the uh, long way back to the history and see who is living at the Ukrainian territory. These are not only Ukrainian, they are also Russian people. Uh, with Crimea, you will have to go back to who owned Crimea and when. And perhaps to recognize that you can never do justice in history if you do just one dividing line. It doesn't work like that. Uh, but I think uh, maybe uh, in more Christian circles to have uh, perhaps deeper and more concrete discussion on these subjects would be important. Thank you very much for your question. 
Uh, maybe I will use an example. Uh, we faced very similar problem uh, in 1990s already because the, uh, for different reasons, the ecumenical organizations in my part of the world were discredited because of their collaboration with communism. And nobody really took ecumenical council of churches seriously, for example. Uh, but people had experiences from the flat seminars, from prayer groups, they went together to Teza, and there was interest in knowing each other. So I think when we started our uh, Institute of Ecumenical Studies, uh, we tried to make sure that we would not teach only ecumenics, but the whole of theology, uh, which would be done ecumenically, and that we would create spaces where people can meet. So I think maybe your chance would be to create uh, something similar like what you have here, but not to call it necessarily ecumenical, but to make it ecumenical. And if people have the experience of being with the others and how enriching it can be and challenging at times as well, uh, then I think you would gain them for what is important. And there may be different expressions of that. A couple of weeks back, I have been directing an Ignatian retreat together with my two Roman Catholic colleagues, and we had people from five different churches there. It was not called necessarily ecumenical, but it was ecumenical in practice. And in the final evaluation, when people could speak about it, one person actually used the word ecumenical. So maybe to create the initiatives where the word ecumenical would be discovered again through the practice. Maybe something which you can try, but in each context it can mean different things. Thank you very much for your question and for your comments. Yes, uh, uh, I think when I spoke about the uh, increasing uh, in political interest in Islam, uh, it's something completely different from uh, having good centers studying Islamic studies. Uh, in a way, in Czech Republic, we have, very, we have some, but we have very few experts who can do that well. And it would be really nice to see that we would also have a place where this discipline would be studied well. So I'm not speaking against that. I think it is much needed. Again, it is how it is used in the, uh, I think, financial decision about the projects and about education, which quite often touch only the very surface level. It becomes part of the rhetoric. And in the commissions uh, where the projects are judged, this rhetoric quite often gets through. Or when the new places are open in the American and in some of the Western universities, again, there is a required profile of what people should have, and it features there. So this would be, to my understanding, this supra-level. 
And uh, I think that uh, what I consider perhaps more important is to really take care that good places where theology could be studied, Christian theology, would remain. And at the same time, good places where Islam could be studied would be created also in Europe. I think also it's a really good idea in some of the institutions to have a place of Islamic studies where future imams in Europe could study. Uh, because it means that if they live here then, they would not have culturally alienating experience. So I don't think I would be opposed at all to that. But I am sometimes quite uncomfortable with what is done with Islam and supporting Islamic uh, uh, or supporting the preference for investigating Islam on the more populist level. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that in some of the issues, churches already work together and it has been beneficial. But I think that we have to also, being realistic, we have to count that the, what I call ecclesial diplomatic and the prophetic, they would always be intention. And it may be intention not only within particular churches, but also in what we do together. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, during the... Uh, when our president had a very strong speech against uh, uh, refugees and migrants. It, uh, many people were upset that the Archbishop in Prague didn't challenge that and practically shared the uh, views. But the biggest public critique of that came from the Roman Catholic Church as well. So I think the uh, both ecumenical and generally Christian involvement in the society will always be more voices than one. And we should not be afraid of that plurality. So, and I think that when there would be human rights issues at stake, for example, or social issues, then joining together uh, would make stronger impact in the society. But I don't think we can realistically expect that everybody would join. And uh, uh, I think uh, the fact that uh, there are churches and they say different things may not be necessarily a disadvantage. At least they don't say only the most appalling things. Uh, 
Um, a small question with the Ukrainian background. Uh, I studied in Switzerland and I know some very good and very old pastors. Uh, most of them are reformed, uh, and also I know some German pastors which are quite involved in the ecumenical studies and information. And I see, uh, and my question, uh, because I know I can say ecumenism as spirituality. Uh, places like this are uh, quite good, uh, it's just concerned, but I also see a kind of growing up uh, from the very, uh, from the communities and the churches inside a kind of spirituality or desire for Eastern spirituality or kind of ancient art of spirituality. Uh, if I, when I ask them, why do you read, uh, for example, uh, books like, uh, Roman, uh, sorry, Romanian spirituality, Romanian monasteries, the Ukrainian, Eastern, uh, Western, South monasteries, and so on and so forth. But they told me, actually, if we don't uh, increase our spirituality and our desire for it, for inner life, we will be disappeared, actually. I don't want so my question to be too provocative, but maybe it is. Uh, how do you see this challenge, as one hand, to uh, concerning Protestant spirituality in general, from your perspective on as from a Czech uh, country? Thank you. Thank you very much for that, and I'm sorry that I had to cut down the part on spirituality a little bit. Uh, yes, I would agree that uh, uh, the Jesus prayer or the experience with icons or liturgical spirituality, this is uh, some of the examples of duvels which we can learn from the Orthodox churches, from the Orthodox traditions. And there are some monasteries which are really hospitable where you can go and experience uh, uh, what does it mean to live as a Christian according to the Eastern sources? I have done quite a lot of work in that in the past. And I think what I see as the most enriching is the... Uh, I think it's Vyacheslav Ivanov who said that we need to learn to breathe with both parts of our lungs. And uh, I think that the Eastern Christian spirituality can learn, can teach us to have that to have a different depth, uh, to have a, uh, maybe a different appreciation of the physical, of the silence, uh, different appreciation of the symbolic, and then to relate it back to all that we are. There are of course also dangers that there are places of spirituality which would support nationalism and which would support control of people, but unfortunately, uh, like I spoke about church's political involvement, this is something which cuts also spirituality. You would have monasteries where the monks would behave like uh, the type of elders. They would want to control every single type of life of people. So I'm not kidding that if people want to buy a washing machine, they would go to the elder and they will ask which one they are allowed to buy. But this is a caricature of spirituality. And I think we need to move beyond that. And I think really working with the best, what is available uh, in that Christian family, can enrich us really profoundly. Thank you very much. To exemplify some of the constraints that you talked about in your lecture, we're now going to take two questions in one go. Um, this is a very ecumenical gesture. So can we get your both questions? Yeah. And then we will get Ivana to answer them both. All right. Jane, thank you very much for your lecture. You gave us a very in-depth understanding of the ecumenical movement. Thank you for that. However, I have a question. Um, the ecumenical movement, you have mentioned the justice and peace process, which we know is coming on from 1948 in Amsterdam, and has just been um, developed over the time. And also, you mentioned that there's many organizations out there, secular, that is also doing work in society. And um, however, what I do not understand is um, how do we as a communal movement connect the pilgrimage of justice and peace, which is the new vision for the communal movement in the 21st century, but I haven't heard anything um, you mentioned.
mentioned how you bring the justice and peace, which the Amerika movement is currently working on and in the past, and how does the connection come? How do we promote the cognitive of justice and peace, which in my understanding is a very strong potential to bring not only unity for the, all the denominations, but also to bring to, for work in the society. So how does the ecumenical movement encourage those members that hasn't received this moment of justice and peace as a new vision? How do we encourage that for those and also beyond the walls of the ecumenical movement and the churches to work on that? We see a lot of work that we're doing in the society, but the church has become irrelevant. And like many has mentioned, the work has been done, but if we bring it under one umbrella, it can unite everybody on both sides, ecumenism and society and politics. So my question is, how do we promote as a ecumenical movement the pilgrimage of justice and peace in the society, among the ecumenism and amongst the churches? Thank you. Thank you. So, well, thinking about that. I'd like to formulate and share my question. Uh, what do you think you, uh, scientists ruling in the Czech Republic about the settlement of nationalism? What's the ground, ground the explanation for this new kind of nationalism and I think it's, it's needed a more complex, uh, it's a more complex settlement and we need a more complex explanation for this. It's a ecumenical gap between West and East. It's maybe this missing of acknowledgement means by Charles Seiler, the same uh, topic or, or maybe the need of sovereignty. It's not only for Great Britain, how it's in, in the East. Thank you. <laughs> I have uh, a couple of minutes for each question. How wonderful. So, uh, first, justice and peace. Uh, uh, I think we can promote it by living it. And in my experience, uh, it has to be done differently in each context. You probably picked up already that I'm quite skeptical to some expressions which would be more proclamative, and this would be part of my culture. If you proclaim things, uh, in Czech setting, whether a societal setting or ecclesial setting, people would not listen to you very much. It's just another ideology which is bypassing. Bye-bye. Uh, so what you have to do is really to engage at the grassroots level. Uh, during the uh, process when our government, for example, was refusing the refugees, the church people were, and other NGO people were demonstrating against it. Uh, there were people who started the uh, open initiatives which were called exactly the hate-free zone. And I think you can see the justice and peace element present in that. It was in the churches where people started to serve breakfasts. Uh, one church uh, in, uh, cooperated with the local mosque. They did lunches uh, at one point together for people, perhaps in similar way like you have heard here about the Berlin uh, uh, Day of Religions or the Night of Religions where people from different communities brought food and shared food and it was open to everybody. Uh, so, and uh, some bookshops or cafes or theaters, they also proclaimed to be hate-free zones. And this was, I think, a very good and common expression of that. It cuts through different church communities, but also different segments of the societies. And this was good. In our setting, this would work much, more, much better than some proclamatory thing. But culture differs from culture, so I think this needs to be found in different contexts what work the best there. The denationalism. Uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, it's interesting that I think that the nationalism is different in different parts, not only of the post-communist Europe, but even Central Europe. And it has to do with the pre-communist history. There is different, the Polish and the Hungarian nationalism would be different from ours. In our nationalism, uh, we would not have the dream of the great, uh, I do not know whether Grand Moravia or Roman Empire under Charles IV. This would be almost like a joke for us. This would not be part of our nationalism. And still about 10 years back or so, we would pride ourselves in not having really much of nationalism in the country. It is not the case now. I think the Czech nationalism would be fed uh, by... Uh, the ideology which would be against different segments in society and outside. 
nationalism which is against the cities, especially against Prague and its intellectuals, nationalism which is against the universities and against the educated people, nationalism which is against those who want to invite others to the country and to, in inverted commas, take our work. I think this can give you some idea about whom the nationalism is directed to. We do not speak any longer about a working class, but this would be people, especially in the poor parts of the country, where there would be higher unemployment and people with smaller education. And it would exploit the anti-German sentiment, which would still be present in some parts of the country, still after the World War II, but it would be artificially fed during the communist period. Uh, in the cities and among university educated young people, you would not find it anymore. In the country and in some border areas, you would still find it. So this would be one aspect which would feed into the Czech nationalism. Uh, another aspect which would feed into the Czech nationalism would be the propaganda which is done around the terrorist attacks, for example, and around the refugee crisis. And it would be used for these national purposes. And it would be like the a vicious circle that nationalism would feed the xenophobic politics of the parties and the xenophobic politics would feed the nationalism in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that, Ivana. Um, we have two items of, of housekeeping before we, we finish this session that, that I'm going to go straight into because I know that when you applaud, it's the end of housekeeping and we can't get anything done. So the first to say is that the seminar groups will meet directly after your coffee break. Um, we, we'll have an extra, an extra five minutes uh, onto the coffee break. This is what happens when a Brazilian and an Irish person get involved in organizing the timing of things. Um, so that will be at 20, 20 past 11. Please go directly to your seminar rooms. They are found on a little map at the back of your, of your, of your logbook. Um, so so find, your, find your way directly there. Um, it's a shorter coffee time than you might like, but, but drink it quickly. Burn your mouth as a, as a sign of witness. Um, the, the second uh, item is that you, you were introduced yesterday to the bigger book that looks like your handbook, which is what we have uh, tactfully called uh, our treasure. Uh, this is the account given that all of you have given of yourselves. Uh, and where you've come from and what you're doing. If you'd like a copy of that, it's going to be available from Lars and Chiara at the office. Um, they will be set up at the tax collector's booths uh, and for, for a mere 10 euro, you, you, can, you can walk away with a, a personal treasury and, and, and enjoy it forever. Um, finally, uh, it falls to me to thank I Ivana. We invited her to provide us with an introduction to something that's not just ecumenism, but the ecumenical movement. And you expect the movement to move, and it moves in odd and interesting directions at times. And we've got a really lively sense of the dynamism that's happening here, the ambivalences and ambiguities of religion both becoming uh, live and active and present, and in some ways declining in other ways. So the ambiguities and ambivalences of the religious presence that we have to deal with as ecumenists as well as that challenge to see ecumenism not just as uh, interchurch relations management or what John Macquarie beautifully called uh, ecclesiastical joinery. Uh, it, it, it's not just that. It's something interdisciplinary and profoundly theological and spiritual. And thank you so much, Ivana, for sharing that with us.